Well, it's now 10.30 on Thursday, and that means it's time for Brainstorming the Human Connection, brought to you by the South Dakota Humanities Council. My name is Lawrence Diggs, and I will be the host for you today. This is an interactive program, in case you're new to this or you just forgot. And the program really is about exchanging ideas. It's a conversation more than a couple of talking heads talking at you. <clears throat> we want to uh, encourage and prompt conversation about a particular topic. Today, we're going to be talking about forensics, and you'll learn a lot about forensics, but it's something that um, is very important <clears throat> in terms of a uh, ongoing understanding of what happened, what has happened to people before, you know, the deceased, why they why they died, how they died, uh, what was their condition. And that tells us not only something about the recently deceased, but it can tell us a lot about people who've been dead for a while. And in some kinds of forensics, people who are still alive, you know, but they, you know, like uh, accounting forensics and stuff like that. So we'll we'll be talking about forensics. So you'll, you'll have a better idea of that. <clears throat> but we just like to remind you that it is an interactive conversation. And to help that along, uh, Colby has so graciously put in a few prompt questions. You don't have to ask those. Those are not the limits, <clears throat> but they can give you a kind of, maybe prompt you and maybe give you a little bit more uh, courage to ask a question. So we <clears throat> encourage you to read that. Also, during this program, when and if there are some websites or some particular information that is we think will be useful, we will put that in the chat. And when we put it in the chat, if you go to the chat, you'll see, depending on your software, three little dots. If you click on that, you should get a drop-down menu that will allow it to save either to your downloads folder <clears throat> or your desktop. But it's to make it uh, convenient. <clears throat> if you can't figure that out or you don't see the buttons or something, you can also uh, copy the whole thing and paste it in your particular uh, word processing software. I will warn you also that <clears throat> for some reason, just recently, I couple to last night or this morning, I developed a cough. So I'll be trying to control that. So if you see my eyes go like that, it's probably I'm holding, trying to hold a cough in or something. <clears throat> so, Today, we're going to be talking about uh, forensics, and we have uh, with us Haley Omiso, and and uh, she is going to become a forensic expert, you know, and she'll tell you more about uh, what she's doing and what she's up to, because that's what this program is about. And this is a, a unique approach, and one I really appreciate. <clears throat> Because, you know, for a long time now, people have been trying, have been struggling with what to do about the missing and murdered indigenous people. People that the system doesn't seem to, you know, they don't seem to be taking this very sim uh, seriously. You know, if you have one or two people, it's just like, well, they're important, but you also have other things that are important. But when you see a trend, and when there's so many people, missing and murdered and you also see a trend of ignoring the the enormity of the problem then you have no other choice but to fix it yourself and that's what i appreciate about the okomi forensics project and we will be talking about that uh, with haley omiso hello and welcome haley hi thanks for having me <laughs> Well, let's start off by getting an idea of who Haley is, because I think uh, people uh, need to know not only who you are, but like where you've come from. You know, what who, what are you about? Who is Haley? All right. Well, in every presentation that I do and every talk that I do, I always uh, start with an introduction in my ancestral language. Uh, so, Oki ni stuni danaku isamaki ni taiping singkak sem heli omiso ni mohto tu amska pipikani ki hopi tua ni mohto tu bunukasi ki itanyop ni citatski ni matsuko University of Montana ki okumi forensics. 
So hello everyone. My name is Haley Omiso. Um, I grew up on the Blackfeet Reservation, so I'm a descendant of the Blackfeet tribe. Um, I'm also an enrolled member of the Hopi tribe in Arizona. Um, I am currently a PhD student here at the University of Montana. I'm in my second year, uh, hoping to reach PhD candidacy uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, but I study forensic and molecular anthropology. Um, so basically what I do um, is I do skeletal remains analysis. Um, so we partner with the Montana State Crime Lab here and we do uh, reports that surround um, helping to identify the individual. And so we do a biological profile. So we look at the features on skeletal remains um, to try and determine their biological sex, their possible age at death, um, the stature at death or their height. We look at uh, trauma, trauma patterns. So during my master's, I did my study on analyzing um, fracture patterns that were associated with intimate partner violence, also known as domestic violence, um, looking specifically at facial fractures. Um, and we also do taphonomy. So that's basically like the modifications that occur after a person is deceased. Um, so in Montana, we get a lot of um, scavenging, bear activity, um, and we're able to, to kind of um, determine that um, activity and how it differs from other trauma patterns. Um, and right now for my PhD, I am learning DNA analysis. Um, so for my project currently, I am working with ancestral remains. Um, so as we have kind of spoken about, um, the missing and murdered indigenous people epidemic is not a new issue. It's been going on for a very long time and we can see these, these types of cases within these collections, such as teaching collections at universities, um, museum collections, personal collections, um, as well as residential schools. And so trying to get um, these human remains repatriated back to their tribal lands or their family members that are still alive um, is kind of what I focused on in my PhD and doing that using DNA analysis. And so in doing this work, I have also founded the nonprofit organization Okumi Forensics. Okumi means to use one's voice in the Blackfeet language. Um, so I started this nonprofit so that I could continue this work and provide these services to tribal nations and communities, impacted families um, that are in need of services. Um, and trying to bring their their people to justice. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about what I do. <laughs> okay, that's a that's a good start. Um, Just tell us about bit. the yeah yeah yeah. Tell us <clears throat> about your Okomi forensics. How did that get started? Where did that idea come from? And and where where do you see it going? Yeah. So, um, like I said, I'm getting ready to. I'm, hopefully going to be graduating soon with my PhD in forensic and molecular anthropology. Um, and in searching for a position for myself where I could, you know, carry on this work and work with, with my home community and the tribal nations. Um, I didn't really find a position that was out there that worked specifically for the MMIP crisis. Um, and so that's why I started Okami Forensics is so we can kind of just be another resource for our indigenous people um, that they can turn to for um, whether it's field and excavation services. So actually going out and looking for missing people out in the field, um, DNA analysis, um, forensic anthropology lab services, like I discussed earlier, and then just MMIP advocacy. So just putting on these events and talking with families and just hearing what they, what they need and trying to help uplift their voices. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned you're trying to figure out or, or or come to some conclusion or help a community figure out what are the services that they need. Can you talk to us a little bit and share with us what is it that they need? Yeah, so, I mean, there's a lot of cases that are going on in the reservations that are still unsolved. Um, for one, the, the main case that really sparked my educational career and my nonprofit uh, was the case of Ashley Heavy Runner Loring, 
who is my relative and classmate from the Blackfeet <clears throat> Reservation. And so she went missing um, back in 2017, so about seven years ago almost. Um, and they have still not found her. And so I basically just tried to learn as much as I can in the forensics field to see how I could help in her case and cases like her, like hers. Um, and so there, like I said, are still very many cases that are still unsolved um, and every case is different. And so I think by providing, being a resource that can provide forensic services, we can bring in, you know, many different experts in the field um, that pertain to those cases specifically. Mm -hmm. When you talk to people about what they think they lack, tell us about how you go about that. And and uh, is it easy for people to talk about that? Or it, it doesn't seem like a lot of talking, at least from the other side, <laughs> has been going on. So uh, how do you how do you how do you make that conversation happen? And how do you get people to respond? Yeah. Are you referring to the families or? Yeah, right. Because often, you know, if you haven't been asked a question or you grow up thinking nobody really wants to hear that, when somebody actually asks you, even if they're sincere, one have, the brain takes a while to sort of like, mm, is this a thing or not? Or you may not have the vocabulary because a lot of language is parroting. So you you repeat phrases and things and just change verbs and nouns. Um, so if you if you don't have a pattern of discussing something, you may feel it deeply, but not be able to really say it. So I'm just wondering if, in fact, that is the case, and if so, how do you, you know, how do you bridge that gap? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think a lot of it stems from frustration. Mm. Um, a lot of these families are feeling frustrated that their their family mm. members' case isn't being handled in the way that they think it should be. Um, so I think that just, like I said, by being a resource and providing these services and just being a listening ear for them, um, it does really help them to open up and kind of start to discover where these cases may, um, need services in certain areas and how we can, how we can try and accommodate that. Um, so since we just launched in January, we've actually had a lot of people reach out to us um, in need of help. And even if they don't know specifically, you know, what it is that their their um, family members' case is lacking, we can kind of try and help navigate that with them and and figure out, you know, what they might need um, and provide those services to them. Um, I think I think that a lot of it is frustration towards law enforcement. Um, however, on the reservations, our police officers are are oftentimes very overworked and understaffed. Um, so they don't they don't have the resources themselves to be able to carry out a lengthy investigation like that. Um, and so we can also help law enforcement as well. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I came to realize in the last five or ten years is that many communities don't actually have a coroner or anybody who really is familiar with how to do research as, of the kind that you're talking about. Uh, how, do, how, does, how will you fit into, you know, because it seems like I have lots of opportunities, but a lot of people, you know, a, a coroner is one of those kind of positions that a lot of people, a lot of towns, it's kind of like, you know, you know, you have to have a funeral but you don't really want your kids you know, to be the ones who are dealing with those dead bodies. Or, you know, you know you need a funeral home, but there are people who still have a hard time like just even going to the funeral home, even hospitals, actually, for that matter. So uh, I'm just I'm just wondering, like. Your community. Uh, yes, you'll be working on a specific problem that is is a major problem. But how do you find the, the reception to, you know, to for you personally to to this kind of work? Yeah. So in being in the forensics field, I've learned that every state is different in who they have um, as far as medical examiners or right. or and a coroner 
and forensic anthropologists. So in the state of Montana, we technically don't have a forensic anthropologist that works for our state, um, simply because they use us at the university. <laughs> we are the forensic anthropologists. Um, so they don't have an actual position for that here, but we do have medical examiners um, that work at the state crime labs. And so we have one stationed in Billings and then one here in Missoula. Um, and then we do have coroners um, that go by counties. Um, however, the coroners are usually um, one of the sheriffs. So right. yeah, um, in the forensics aspect, I think that they definitely could use a lot more training um, I'm not, I mean, I'm not a sheriff. I don't know what, what kind of training they go through to be a coroner, but I know that, that that's typically who it is, is, is one, one of the officers. Right. Um, and so I think that by having an actual forensics team that can go and assist would be very helpful. Um, because oftentimes what happens is, um, scenes can get contaminated, um, just because, you know, they don't know, you know, what, what they may be looking for, or they may not know how to handle certain things, um, pieces of evidence. And so if we were able to be there, you know, when they get called out to a scene, I think that that would be really essential in finding more evidence um, at the time, because oftentimes now in the cases that we work on, um, which are mostly cold cases, um, the evidence isn't there. Um, it was either lost or it's never been recovered. Um, so that's really a huge issue that we run into right now. Um, and even if we do find evidence, you know, after so many years, it's that yield of DNA or whatever it is that you're testing for gets lower and lower. And so that is also an issue. Right. Well, that's the thing that I ran into um, is that many people or many communities a lot of things happen that nobody really understands because they don't know how to look at the body or look at the surroundings and come up with a narrative of really, you know, a, 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 a narrative that is supportable by data. You know, uh, many people can write fictional novels, but really actually having something that come up, you know, that, that is supported by data and test because there are lots of things that we know because people have studied like well you know what's the time rate and process of of a of uh, animal decay and in this particular case human decay uh we also can look at like the the surroundings and find out if if the surroundings are consistent with our theory of what's what's happening all those kind of you know under the hood stuff and it just seems like uh, that you should be getting lots of support if you just want to do that work. It seems like you should be able to um, support your organization and your, you know, the things you want to do by charging the rates that people who know what they're doing get for that work. So how would you respond to that? Yeah. Yeah. Um... Like I said, we're still very early in getting our organization going, but that's kind of the main thing that we're working on is just building relationships right now. Mm -hmm. um, so our goal isn't to work against law enforcement. Our goal is to work with law enforcement. And so in doing that, we do have to build those relationships and that trust first. Um, however, we do work for the families and, you know, giving our services to the families. But I think in order for, for it all to work, you know, we all have to work together as a team. Yes. And we can't work against each other. Um, um, and so, yeah, I've just been trying to extend a branch to, to everyone possible that I can and just letting everyone know that I'm here to help. I know I'm only one person, but I have uh, many great volunteers um, that are willing to help as well. And so we've um, already went back to the Blackfeet Reservation and helped a few times. Um, and we plan to do that again uh, this year. And then as we build more relationships with other tribes um, and in other states as well, we can also um, do work there too. So right. <laughs> yes, we've, okay, we've well, received a lot of great support though so far. Great, that's very good to hear. Can you share with us some of the collaborations <clears throat> that you have developed and ones that you feel you need to, to develop to accomplish your mission? 
Um, so first of all, we'll be partnering with the University of Montana um, Forensic Anthropology Department. Um, so that's where most of our, our volunteers will come from. So that's all PhD uh, or graduate students um, that have been trained in this field for a long time. Um, that'll be going out into the field with us and doing the DNA work. Um, we'll, it's possible that we will have to partner with another DNA lab too um, until we can get our own established. Um, so we are still working on that as well. Um, and that kind of goes along uh, which labs are accredited. So technically the University of Montana is not an accredited lab just yet. Um, I think that they're working on it, but um, that's kind of what sh we strive to do is build our own forensic lab, which will be the first one, at least in Montana, um, that'll work specifically for the tribes and can provide all of, all of those services um, without accreditation. Um, so yeah, and then we're, we're also partnering with, um, or getting MOUs put in place with other law enforcement agencies. Um, and that kind of depends right now just on the cases that we are working on and what level um, those cases are at, whether it be federal, um, state, or just tribal. Um, so that's kind of another issue that we run into as well as working on the reservations is that um, they don't go through through the state, they go through tribal police and then through the Bureau of Indian Affairs and then to the FBI. Um, and so when it gets to the FBI, that's where things kind of get a little more difficult. Um, but I think being in communication with them, we can definitely still help and assist in some of those cases, um, specifically because we don't have an FBI lab in Montana. Um, so when when evidence is found, it has to get sent to Salt Lake City, which is our nearest one, which is pretty far away. Um, so I think that by having our own forensic lab here, uh, we can get uh, a faster turnaround with those results that we get. Right. Well, I want to come back to this developing the lab because I think I think that's central to what you're trying to accomplish. But I want to give our other esteemed guest a uh, an opportunity to. Uh, ask questions, weigh in on something you've heard so far or something that you would like to hear. Anybody have things that they would like to ask? How about Vicky? If she turn on her, turns on her mic. <laughs> but you've got to turn on your mic, Vicky. Keeps going I on. was just wondering about numbers. Let me see if I can put this together in my head. So how many missing person reports do you have compared to um, murders and deaths? So I'm trying to figure out if you have a lot of murders and you have fewer missing persons uh, or you're assuming they're dead and of these missing persons, how many people uh, appear, reappear? I mean, what's the ratio of that? Um, and after a while, um, does the family just give up and, and so forth? I mean, how many of this people are going through this? Yeah, um, I honestly can't give you an exact number. And that's one thing that I always talk about is we have stats on our website on alchemyforensics.com. Um, however, I think that all of these statistics are going to be an undercount specifically because of underreporting, um, race, racial misclassification or gender misclassification. Um, and I definitely don't think that the families do ever give up in those cases. Um, and I think one of the issues too, is that one thing that I see a lot is when the medical examiners are um, determining the cause of death or the manner of death, um, they often say that they will be hypothermia or that they had died from natural causes. But I think that that's where the families start to get a little frustrated is that they don't, that they think that there's more surrounding that case, but then they often just get closed because because it just was hypothermia or whatever the medical examiner had said. 
but I think that it goes further than that in the investigation portion of things and collecting evidence and not having enough evidence in those cases could could typically, you know, just throw a case out with it being a homicide. Um, so I don't have an exact number for you, um, but that is one of the issues that we are definitely going to look into and in building, you know, a, a better database out there because when I first started going into forensics, I did a research project on how many missing people we had um, that were Native American in the state of Montana. And in the database that I was looking through, which was through the state, it said we had maybe eight missing people. And that just was not right. That was definitely an undercount. Um, and so there was another researcher that had um, put together a database and there were hundreds of people that were still missing in there or that had not received justice. Um, and so, yeah, that's definitely one of the biggest issues that we face is not having an actual count of who is missing and who is murdered. One of the things, uh, another thing is, um, what about, um, well, the main reason for finding him is to reassure the parents what has happened to him. Um, but how do you separate uh, suicide from, accidental death and then, you know, we don't really know where all these people have gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's more of a job for the medical examiner. But um, from what I have seen, there are definitely studies out there that have looked at um, the, the angle of projection for one thing. Um, so typically you'll see like the angle of, of the bullet go through the, the skull or wherever it is um go at a certain angle if it was suicide whether or which would differentiate from if it was a homicide it may be going at a different angle that's maybe one thing that they can look at um but yeah that's that's about as far as scope as i can go as far as the forensic anthropology side is just looking at the skeletal remains and the projection site and how is the suicide rate how is the suicide rate yeah. Um, it's definitely very high, uh, especially on reservations. Um, yeah, I also don't have an exact number of that for you, but um, I know that it is very, very high right now. Well, one, one of the, oh, go ahead, Sharon. Got to turn your mic on though. Do you also work with, um... with your same type of affiliation, university, tribal, in, in the surrounding states, like South North Dakota, Minnesota, Idaho. I saw, uh, this is incidental, but I saw the um, movie Wind River quite a while ago. That was Blackfeet. That was really terrific, awful. I mean, it was terrifically presented. It's awful. And I can see in that case where Somebody could just say, well, they she died of hyperthermia, but she didn't die of hyperthermia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we see it everywhere. I mean, like I said, I've had a lot of people reach out to me already from different states, such as South Dakota, um, such as Wyoming, uh, Washington, and then even um, down in Arizona, especially around the Navajo Nation, too. They're one of the the highest... Um, they have the highest rates, I think, in the country right now as Navajo Nation because they are the largest reservation. Um, but yeah, this is definitely happening everywhere. It's not it's not just locally. It's definitely a huge epidemic. So do you work with them? Do, does your university department say, we have this missing case and um, it looks as if he or she or they took a route toward your direction you picked up anything how, how do you even begin to look, trace somebody down yeah I know it is really difficult and like I said it is just case to case basis um, but how it works here at the university is that we we have to get called out by law enforcement and so it doesn't typically it doesn't have to be just in Montana it can be anywhere in the surrounding states um, so I think that we have got called out to like Wyoming where like the Wind River is um, and 
Yeah. So for the university, you have to get called out, but that's kind of what I'm hoping to do with my nonprofit organization is that we'll be able to, to kind of self deploy is what it's called. And so we'll be able to just go to those areas and do our own investigations and help in those areas without having to be invited. Um, and that kind of goes back to just building those relationships with law enforcement and kind of be kind of prepare protocols as well to where um, we can be a part of of the first people that are on the scene. Mm-hmm. One I- of the questions, one of the questions that would uh, sort of tag along with that is how do you build the rapport, uh, not just with your communities, but other communities that allows them to know that you can be contacted and what kinds of things you are able to do? You know, I mean, you know, there used to be this saying, this looks like a job for Superman, you know, so what kind of things that happen would happen that somebody would say, this looks like a job for Okomi Forensics, you know, mm-hmm. how, how would that work? Yeah. Um, so typically we would get called out if, if possible human remains are found um, or a possible burial site. And so we would, we would get called to the scene and then we would go out and we would do our field search um, so typically we get into like a big long line search and we all walk together at the same time and putting pin flags down where there's possible evidence or the possible burial site. Um, even if we do know where where it's most likely at, um, we still have to we still have to go through that that protocol. Um, and then just very meticulously, we have to document everything. And we we typically don't work with shovels, too. We have to use little handheld um <laughs> travels as we go and we're we're sifting all of the dirt and everything as we go to make sure that we don't miss anything at least to the best of our abilities um and then helping to collect all of that evidence as well and then it would go to to whoever the the medical examiner or the crime lab after that um but we would we would hope that at least in the cases of uh the reservations that when we have our lab up and running, that that can still go to us. And so we can follow out that whole process. And then how do people, uh, somehow I missed, how do people know that you exist and uh, that you you could be of assistance to them and what kind of assistance you could be? Uh, Of course, at some point it's word of mouth, but how do you get that started? Yeah, right now we're just kind of trying to to get it out in the media as much as we can, um, putting on these events and just making sure that the families know that that we're here. Um, I've also been reaching out to like tribal councils um, around the state of Montana um, because I definitely think that bringing them into and making sure that they're a part of the conversation that they can help us navigate uh, who we can talk to further on that. So talking with the tribal councils as well as their tribal leaders, um, because that's a lot of what we try and promote with our business too, is that um, we intertwine this modern technology with cultural traditions and traditional knowledge. And so making sure that that's a priority is that we're doing these things in a way that is still culturally sensitive to these tribes, Um, because every tribe is different and every tribe handles um, human remains and DNA and everything like that differently um, and just making sure that we're aware of all of that. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess that brings me to to uh, the a question about your unique position as a sort of a new player on the block, maybe the only player on the block in some way. Um, but uh, talk to us a, a bit about the things that you can bring to the table that others cannot or are not bringing to the table. What what you what's your unique position? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that that's a lot of what I saw when I was developing this this organization is that law enforcement um, that they typically are not very aware of the cultural tradi- traditions and the way that we handle human remains maybe differently from non-Indigenous people. Um, And I've seen that become an issue in certain cases where um, a family 
had to deal with with their family member not being handled in the right way. Um, for example, cremation, a lot of tribes and a lot of tribal members um, are against the use of cremation because um, it goes against their cultural beliefs. But, you know, the the funeral home may not be aware of that. And so they go ahead with the cremation um, or something like that. That's just an example. Um, another example may be uh, if for one tribe that I had spoken with, if if there were human remains that were inside of a house, if they had died inside of a house, they would have to go out the window. They can't go through the door. And so a lot of people aren't really aware of that. And so making sure that you're having those discussions and making sure that we are aware of that before we do anything at all is definitely at, at our top priority. And I think that's something very unique to our organization, for sure. Mm -hmm. And you are in the process of learning all of these things, I, I take it, because more tribes you work with, they're, they're whole different peoples and, you know, I mean... Yeah in many ways. So yeah. tell us about the process of learning those kind of cultural norms for different people. How do you go about yeah. doing that? And what, yeah. what unique things have you learned so far? <laughs> yeah, so since I'm specifically working with my tribe, the Blackfeet tribe right now, um, we have someone called the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. Um, and so they handle all of our ancestral remains or artifacts that are being held in museums and collections and everything like that and trying to get them repatriated. Um, but they make sure that the curators are doing that in a way that is um, appropriate, I guess, for our tribe. Um, and only certain people are able to handle those remains and those artifacts. Um, so for the Blackfeet tribe specifically, um, if they are a bundle holder or a very high ceremonial person, um, they're not allowed to be around human remains or, um, you know, certain artifacts too. And so I kind of take it upon myself to kind of be that person that can handle those remains. And so they've been teaching me how I can go about that in a spiritual way as well to protect myself. And so just having many, many conversations back and forth of how I can do that and making sure that I'm going about it in the right way, um, I feel like has been very beneficial. And so I plan to carry that out in my work with the other tribes as well. Um, so there are many resources within within the reservations and within the tribes that, um, that we can talk to, such as the TIPO or the Tribal Historic Preservation Office. So, yeah, there's many, so, many key players there. One of the things, oh, Vicki, go ahead. Just one more question. I'm confused. So mm -hmm. when bones are found, mm -hmm. does it make a difference if they're found on the reservation or off? How do they, how do you know if you're dealing with bones and stuff? How, do, how does the police department know to notify you? How do you get in on that? And is there a separation? Do you not investigate? Um, people that are, are non-native how does that work yeah through the university um we do investigate you know any case that is coming through um it doesn't really matter their ethnic background um but there are ways that we are trying to research that will help us distinguish that um in like basic anthropological methods they have used methods back in the day that typically ended up being very racist. Um, and so we are kind of trying to stray from that um, in separating our people. But um, with the use of DNA today, that's kind of one thing that we are trying to do with our research and with my research specifically is finding those genotypes that are specific to our people that shows our familial connections um, in our genealogy. Um, when when you're out in the field and you stumble upon remains, um, we can typically try and try and distinguish if they are historic um, just by the the overall preservation of the remains and what may be associated with those remains. If there are um, other artifacts or um, any clothing or anything like that, um, to kind kind of try and distinguish what time period they may have been from. Um, 
<clears throat> but for modern cases, um, we can typically even just look at the disturbed vegetation. If it is like a burial site, you can kind of see um, when that burial site may have occurred, if it was more recent as opposed to like a very, very old grave. Um, and so out in the field, you can't typically really tell if it's just, if it's a native off of the reservation. Um, and there's also the issue with that of, you know, this, all of this land here is tribal land at a time. Um, it's not just on the reservations. And so there is a very high chance that we will find Native American remains off of the reservations today. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then let me see if I can be more clear. Um, so if it's on the reservation right away, you're called in. That's what we're hoping. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming that you only go to reservation territory, right? And we can go do, anywhere, but well, <laughs> yeah. I, th I yeah, think maybe ahead. maybe a, one clarification is this is a new project. So in some ways, things that they're hoping to do are not put in place yet, but this is what they're organizing, trying to do. Right. And right now they're working through the university, which has some MOUs and understandings with different people. And in order to learn what to do, they are working with the university. And this is at a, 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 a fork in the road where when they get all of the resources they need, both uh, educationally, intellectually and experientially, they're hoping to bifurcate or split off and even though you still have connections, but you they, they plan to be more focused on issues that tribes need relative to forensics. Did I get that right? Yes, Haley? thank you for that, yeah. Yes, but there are definitely going to be cases where um, it could be someone from the reservation, but it is off, off reservation territory. Um, and that's just something that we hope to, to kind of help navigate law enforcement with and and there there is a part that that uh, Haley mentioned earlier that's relative to this to this part of the conversation Montana doesn't really have what you call a robust forensic uh apparatus so once they get grounded and and could possibly expand especially with the lab which they don't have not only will they be uh, helpful to the state of Montana, but to the FBI, et cetera, as well. Did, did I, mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I've, I'm trying to get it right. But I do make lots of mistakes. <laughs> That's my specialty. Uh, okay. So speaking of a lab, talk to us a little bit about what goes into a lab and, and the planning for a lab. What What's your vision for what this thing is going to look like? Yeah. Um, at first, we were thinking of starting out very small. Um, but as we progress, I mean, even just within these last few months, we're like, we're going to have to make this much bigger because of, you know, all of the work that we are going to be doing that we plan to do. Um, and so basically right now what we're starting to do is just visiting other labs. So I've been into the Montana State Crime Lab to see everything that they have in there, which is very fancy and I cannot afford right now. But <laughs> Um, they were able to give me some guidelines as far as how you can be accredited as a lab and what you may need in your lab and how it needs to be set up. Um, so for example, we have to have separate rooms, um, as far as like ancient DNA and dealing with those cases and your more modern cases, because you don't want to cross contaminate, um, those kinds of samples. Um, and so... Yeah, basically right now we are just looking at other labs and how they've been set up. Um, and even just like the the ventilation system and everything, everything has to be specific um, for this lab to operate um, and make sure that we are safe in there too uh, when right. we're dealing with them and right. with chemicals and everything like that. Sure. Um, so yeah, we're definitely going to have to build from the ground up, like I said. Um, 
and putting it on the reservation, there isn't a, a structure that is going to, to work for us right now that's already established. And so we have to go through our um, land department and pick a plot of land that will be appropriate for us um, and then start getting our architects and everyone going on all of that once we get enough funding. And yeah, we're hoping to have um, obviously our DNA lab. And so, like I said, we'll have to have two separate portions within our lab that will handle um, more historic samples and then the modern forensic samples um, have a portion that will do our forensic anthropology analyses where we'll actually have the remains set out to be analyzed. Um, and yeah, we're just, we're hoping to kind of just go from there. What what kind of uh, money are we talking in, in, in your mind's eye? A couple million dollars, probably. A couple million. Well, that doesn't really seem unreasonable for the kind of things that you guys have to do for a green field. And for us, trying to find, you know, a couple hundred bucks in our bank account, that seems like a lot of money. But in the grand scheme of things, it's not even, it's it's car, it's car change between the car seats, you know. And, yeah. and especially when we look at the potential for saving money for the FBI, uh, it would seem like a contract, should you be successful with them, uh, mm -hmm. could could justify a chunk of change from the feds. You know, say, okay, if you think you can do this and you have this credibility and you're a newly minted uh, PhD, uh, mm -hmm. we could see where, okay, we just lost a couple million and we think it might be in your desk drawer, you know, or something like that, you know. So it, 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 there, it, it, this doesn't seem like, you know, if you said a couple billion, then I would, I would say, well, that, that might be tricky. A couple million? That's, I'm not saying that it should be. You know, but we shouldn't. But we shouldn't have to have a special unit to go and find missing and murdered murdered people from the tribes either. But here we are. You know. Yeah. But yeah. that said, uh, I think your position. It would seem that you're positioned to be funded. Yeah. Yep. Like I said, we're we're getting a lot of support right now, and even even though we just launched a couple of months ago, we're definitely getting some good funding. Um, we can apply for grants. Um, also asking law enforcement, the FBI. Um, I see the question of the um, Secretary of Interior. Um, there's definitely a lot of places that we can go to and a lot of people that we can ask for funding. Um, and so that's part of our process right now of getting off the ground and running is just finding that funding. Um, I definitely don't think that um, the funding for the lab is unreachable. Um, we kind of put a timeline of a few years. Hopefully we'll have enough um, to get that lab going. But I mean, this organization is taking off so fast that that people need a lab right now. Sure, yeah. And we're going to need a lab right now. Um, yeah. And the labs that we work out of here in the university are very, very small. And we make it work, you know, with with what we have. And so I definitely think that we will have something established here pretty soon. Good. I, I would say dream big and dream for the next 40, 50 years, not mm -hmm. for 40, 50 years behind you and say, oh, look, they, they got along with that. But you'll have new things and new new processes that that you know that people understand about bodies and decay and ways to ascertain what what's happened to this person, how, you know, does the time frame, all that kind of stuff. Uh, imaging software that can, you know, give you information about what to look for, who to look for, uh, all of those kind of things, you know. Mm -hmm. if, if, if you're going to be able to help people, why shouldn't you have that kind of, of technology and that kind of, of uh, support for what you are doing, particularly since even where you exist, it don't exist for your people. You know what I mean? So you being yeah. the one to step up to say, it will be available to us, uh, it seems that should be doable. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, Any I think it's questions? just a little difficult when we don't have a model to really go off of because we are basically the first ones to do this. Um, right. So just trying to navigate all of that and 
breaking down all of these barriers. That's right. One well, at a time is what yeah, it's going to take, I guess. My mm. approach to these, when I'm, when I'm uh, embarking on a new area of interest, is to find out who and where they're having conventions around those things and be there, you know, and be at the table and uh, make sure you have business cards and take a bunch of business cards, develop relationships. And then some of those people will help you. That's when, when I was designing a, a um, shared use kitchen, it's amazing the people that popped out of the woodwork and said, oh, I'll help you, you know? Um, so I think that the people are out there. And so I have high hopes and uh, I'm excited about your project. We're going into the last 10 minutes. I want to give our esteemed panel any uh, last opportunity, if you have questions, uh, to to uh, uh, ask of Haley about her thing before I get into my last question. Anybody? Well, I, I have lots of questions. It's really <laughs> interesting. I, and I don't... Uh, so do we have some place that we can go to to find out what you're doing and and how it works um, you know throughout the United States do you have uh, possibly a organizational thought that you might gather everybody together could um, the um, the federal uh, um, humanities board give you grants um, the reason I say that just seems like there's so much interest now in establishing your relationship uh, within the United States that um, maybe they'd give you some money. Yeah, um, we basically just, well, I've basically just been um, working with journalists to try and get the word out through articles. Um, so we were in Business Insider, um, the Scientific American Journal, um, as well as establishing our social media and our website. Um, so that's pretty much all that we have right now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then as well as talking at other conferences too that are coming up. <laughs> so you have conferences on this? Yes. What would they um, be like? Not, not our organization specifically, but we partner with um, other organizations that do uh, missing and murdered indigenous people work especially with the National Day of Awareness coming up on May 5th. There are several um, events that'll be going on that I'll be speaking at. Um, and then I also speak at uh, forensic specific conferences too. Um, so I spoke at the missing persons, uh, missing and unidentified persons conference last year. Um, mm -hmm. And there's some like on human identification um, and then just forensic science, very broad uh, conferences as well. So I try to speak at those as much as I can to try and get the word out. But yeah. Sure. Well, one last one last question uh, from me anyway, because I don't know that we'd have time to do anymore. Um, but many people go missing, but they go missing because they want to be missing. You know, they might have an abusive spouse. They may be running away from their parents and you know, to get away from them. They may be running away from cult leaders. I know people who uh, they are in relationships and even though the issues have been settled in court, they they feel still threatened, you know, by the people who, who, uh, who want to go against the court ruling. How do you, how do you handle or, you know, what's what you're thinking, I would say your, you know, your experience is going to guide what you finally do. But but what you're thinking about, how do you negotiate? You've been looking for persons been missing for 10 years and you actually find them. Mm -hmm. You know, talk to us a little bit about about that process from your point of view. Yeah, I haven't worked a case yet um, where that was the case. Um, cause typically the cases that we do work on, um, are more cold cases where the family thinks that they are not alive anymore. Um, but in that case, we definitely would have to come up with some kind of protocol that we would follow out, um, working with the law enforcement, um, and the family, but the main priority being just making sure that they're safe. 
um, yeah. and, you know, providing mm -hmm. more resources if needed uh, in those cases to make sure that they stay safe. Um, but yeah, as of right now, we have not worked a case where where that was the case. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I've seen cases like that and, and know of personal cases like that. Um, and, you know, I recognize it as tricky. You know, everybody wants to do the right thing, but there are cases like that where it's not clear what the right thing is because the person that wants to look, you're assuming that they have the best interests of that person in mind. Yeah. And there may not be even a threat of violence or something, but the person just say, you know, I've had it with this person. Mm -hmm. Their lifestyle is different. I've made up my mind. I don't want to ever talk to them again. That's how I cannot uh, become a perpetrator of violence. So that's, that's where I'm, I'm getting out of here. And, mm -hmm. and it's tricky because the other person is grieved, you know, because they're thinking, you know, like, what happened to my loved one? And, you know, like I, I didn't get closure, but the person who is missing is saying, well, that's not my problem. I don't want closure. I've, I have closure and that closure, I don't want opened again, you know? So that could be really, that could be really yeah, tricky. Very tricky. Yeah. Yeah. Very tricky for sure. Yeah. And, and, and that's the kind of thing I think of when I think of forensic, not just that kind of case, but in all of the things like that, that are tricky business, it's not as clean cut as on, you know, Hawaii Five-0 or something like that, yeah. you know, <laughs> I just date myself. Uh, but at any rate, there is, uh, you know, there are lots of very difficult questions that, um, that come up when you're, when you're on the bleeding edge of doing something really new. Mm -hmm. That, uh, mm -hmm. that call that, that will call for answers. Um, one other thing with uh, with your university, what do you see going forward about how you will um, be able to to collaborate with them until you actually get your footing, even if you get the funding and you get your building and stuff like that? There's always kind of like a adolescent period where you're moving out and you know but you know still need a little bit of help or something like that um what do, what do you see what's your vision for like how that might transpire yeah. yeah for sure um so i've over my past nine years here i've built many great relationships with people at the university including my advisor who oversees all of the cases that we do um and then with my peers as well, um, my colleagues that I work with here. And so I definitely have gained a lot of support from them um, to volunteer on some of these cases. And I hope that, you know, once we get enough funding and everything, then we'll be able to bring on a lot of them as staff, as well as other, other um, experts too in the field. But um, what we're hoping to do is just create an MOU with the university's anthropology department um, so that we can continue on that relationship and still bring on volunteers because it goes both ways as, you know, we, we will have um, professionals coming to help us, but they are also gaining experience too as students and which is what I'm going through right now. And I feel like that's very beneficial, especially being in a graduate program. We're not just sitting in, in classrooms and he hearing lectures all day, you know, we're actually out in the field and helping out on real live cases. Um, I think that's the best way to learn. And so I definitely want to carry out that relationship into our nonprofit. Um, and once we get the the lab established too, I would definitely be open to having interns um, and other student volunteers too, as well from, from other schools. Mm -hmm. Well, it's been a wonderful conversation. Uh, I'm certain we will be hearing great things from you, Haley. And I'm just really excited about the potential for you to establish a lab that's dedicated to a big part of what's not happening, but should. It's really a shame that we actually have to have a specialized lab for that. You would think all of the labs would be. But the curious thing happens too, when you decide, well, we're just going to do it by ourselves, suddenly people get interested. You know, that's 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 one of the things I've noticed in my life when I when I want something to happen. 
pretend or like give every indication that this thing's going to happen and I don't really need you. And then it's like, it, if the best time to get a loan is when you don't need one, the bank comes to talk to you when you don't need a loan. But then if you go to talk to them, they don't want to give you the loan. You know? so, <laughs> so I wouldn't be surprised with the same kind of thing. Suddenly everybody, it's a hot new thing in all of the forensic studies is murdering, murdered and, in, and missing indigenous people. You know, it's like, Oh yeah, that's interesting that you guys just heard about that. Anyway, this comes, it brings us to the end of our time together. It's been a wonderful time and I wish you well. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Until thank next you week. Thank everyone for having me. <laughs> All right, until next week, keep brainstorming. <laughs>